President Trump keeping up his full court press on tax reform, telling executives that his plan will make their businesses more competitive and keep more jobs right here at home in the United States. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith. The president returning to the White House after speaking to the National Association of Manufacturers in Washington earlier today. In his speech, the president highlighting how his plan will help give a shot in the arm to the U.S. economy. We will cut taxes on American businesses to restore our competitive edge and create more jobs and higher wages for the American worker. It is time to go from dead last to pretty much the front of the pack. Pretty. Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts is live on the North Lawn for us. John? Uh, you know, our, our eyebrows uh, raised when he said, uh, from the back of the pack to pretty much the front of the pack. We thought he probably would have said right to the head of the pack, but there are some countries that do have lower tax rates than the United States. Sandra, Wednesday was uh, all about uh, what tax reform would do for individuals, and the president presented that in Indianapolis. Today, it was all about what his tax reform plan would do for corporations, highlighting three real big points here. First of all, that the corporate tax rate would be lowered from about the current 35 percent to 20 percent. The small business tax rate the so-called pass-through or S-corporation rate would be capped at a maximum of 25 percent, and that for the next five years, there would be immediate full expensing of capital expenditures for companies. So that means that if you if you buy some new equipment for your shop or your, your factory floor, if you buy a new truck, if you buy a new uh, backhoe or front-end loader or something like that, you get to write it all off immediately. The president wants to bring investment back into the United States by companies who've moved manufacturing, even their corporate headquarters overseas also wants to allow them to repatriate funds that have been held overseas at an attractive tax rate that is yet to be determined but 10 percent has been talked about here's what the president said earlier today here in Washington American businesses to restore our competitive edge and create more jobs and higher wages for the American worker the president also is looking for bipartisan buy-in on all of this however his OMB director, Mick Mulvaney, said earlier today that he's already heard from a lot of Democrats to say, look, if you're going to cut taxes for corporations, we're not with you. We agree that you should cut taxes for small businesses. But, Sandra, what the president is arguing here is that if you really want to create jobs, and clearly small businesses create a lot of jobs, but if you really want to give the economy a shot in the arm, you've got to cut the corporate rate as well. Yeah, a lot of people think that's the most important thing. Small businesses, two-thirds of the U.S. economy. John Roberts, new revelations about administration officials. What do we know now? Yeah, well, and this is this is talking about using private planes to get around the country, and in some cases overseas as well. You know, one one case is clearly problematic, but in other cases, the departments are pushing back hard against it. One of the departments that's pushing back hard is the Department of the Interior, and the Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke taking the Washington Post to task for a story on his travel. Uh, he says that he has taken three private flights since being sworn in. One flight was to the Arctic Circle with a congressional delegation. Another one was traveling to and within the Virgin Islands. Another one was a flight to wildfires out west with the Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue. Listen to what the Secretary of the Interior said. All this travel was done only after it was determined by multiple career professionals at the department that no commercial options existed to meet the promulgated schedule. And as importantly, the flights were only booked after extensive due diligence by the career professionals in the department's general law and ethics division. The Environmental Protection Agency is also pushing back on private flights taken by Administrator Scott Pruitt. The EPA insists that all of them were necessary and all of them received prior approval from the EPA Council. The one case that still really hangs out there, though, is HHS Secretary Tom Price, some $500,000 for private flights. Yesterday, he said that he would pay back $51,000 out of his own pocket for his seat on some 26 flights. He's still on thin ice, though, with President Trump, who told us repeatedly, uh, Sandra, that he's not happy about what happened. By the way, comparatively speaking, an administration source gave me some data uh, from January 20th to September 19th of the first years of the presidencies. President Trump's administration used what are called uh, White House support missions, these private jets, 77 times. The Obama administration, in its first nine months, 94 times.
Sandra? Important point. We will bring that up with our political panel in just moments. John Roberts, thank you. Thank you. All right, much needed aid now pouring into Puerto Rico, but delivering the supplies to those in need is still presenting a major challenge. Garrett Tenney joins us live from Puerto Rico right now with the latest. Garrett? <laughs> Yes, Andrew, and outside the city's capital, there's still many areas where telephones are simply not working. Even our satellite phones have been having issues. We are on the west coast of Puerto Rico in the town of Aguadilla, and this is a stark example of how over the last few days the government has said we have delivered supplies to every town on the island, but in a lot of places, that aid is not simply enough. The town's mayor told me his people are desperate for help, and that the FEMA aid he's picking up from the airport each day isn't enough for the people in his town to have a single meal a day. It's not enough. It's not enough water, not enough food. We don't have gasoline, we don't have diesel, we don't have anything. We had about 3,000 people in line this morning. 3,000 people in line. And only about 1,000 of those people got enough to eat. And you know what happened? People get upset. And his town has 60,000 people, so only a tiny fraction of folks each day are able to get food and water to be able to try to make it through to the next. And yesterday, FEMA announced Aguadilla City Hall would be the site of one of an initial 16 distribution centers across the island. You can see here, though, all that was outside City Hall this afternoon was the town's sole water truck, which only carries enough for 1,000 people. Across the street, sisters from the local Catholic church were feeding a few dozen people rice and beans, and for many, that is the first meal that they have had in days. The mayor tells me he is expecting another flight to arrive tomorrow with aid from private charities, but even that won't be enough, and he says the federal government needs to get here in his town to help before it's too late. Sandra? All right, Garrett Tenney, thank you. Uh, 10,000 federal workers down in Puerto Rico trying to help. Meanwhile, President Trump is defending his administration's response to the devastation there and the recovery efforts. Again, slamming the media, saying their coverage is not accurate. He tweeted this, FEMA and first responders are doing a great job in Puerto Rico. Massive food and water delivered. Docks and electric grid dead. Locals trying really hard to help put many, but many have lost their homes. Military is now on site and I will be there to wish press would treat fairly. Let's bring in Emily Tish Sussman, campaign director at the Center for American Progress Action Fund, and Cheryl Chumley, online opinion editor at the Washington Times. Emily, is the press treating the president fairly? I actually don't think the press is being hard enough on him. Can he get off Twitter and actually focus on getting relief to Puerto Rico and to the Virgin Islands, which he hasn't even mentioned? Still, the Puerto Rico, 44 percent, millions of people have not had clean water in days. Look, you heard that cities that have populations of 60,000 are getting meals delivered for just 5,000 people. Look, he left this situation unmanned for eight days. There's no FEMA director. There's no Homeland Security Cheryl, director. Cheryl, it's worth, point, worth pointing out, about. isn't it, that this is an unprecedented situation that they got slammed by two major hurricanes as the president pointed out in one of those tweets big decisions will have to be made as the to the cost of rebuilding this is a massive project that the president has on his hands and and that's an understatement look what else does the left want president trump to do he sent the army corps of engineers he sent fema he sent national guard he sent active army you've got black hawk, hawk helicopters you've got military trucks the the problem is the island has been wiped out, and that is an act of God, not an act of Donald Trump. He's reacting the best way he can, fielding multiple hurricane crises that we're facing on U.S. soil here in Florida and Texas, the Virgin Islands. This is something that is unprecedented, and right now I think we need to withhold criticism, and if we do think that more can be done, maybe we should get in the act ourselves, take up our own two hands, our own charitable dollars, and reach out personally instead of pointing to the federal and, government. Emily, yeah, not, I mean, not I'm sorry if I think it's tweeting Emily, about the NFL mention, for a week is not enough. in here real quick is that the governor of Puerto Rico has been complimentary of President Trump's handling of this situation, saying the administration and the president, every time we've spoken, they've delivered. All right, I want to move on to another subject because we're, we're talking about uh, government officials and their use of, of government taxpayer-funded uh, flights uh, for personal travel. The latest with Ryan Zink, you heard a bit with John Roberts earlier. But Secretary Zinke responding, saying all this is just a little BS. Watch this. 
I'd just like to address, in the words of uh, General Schwarzkopf, a little BS uh, on travel. There are times, however, we have to utilize charter services because we often travel in areas and are under circumstances that we don't have other flight options. I fly coach. Uh, Emily, what did you make of the secretary's defense of his use of those private of those planes? Yeah, clearly there is a very strong culture among the cabinet and I'd say the entire administration that he appointed the president from the president on down. He appointed very wealthy people who are used to getting exactly what they want and now they are treating the government as the ones to be able to provide that for them. And look, I do just want to respond to the governor of Puerto Rico's comments. How could you not? How could you as the governor when you are wholly dependent on federal aid right now? How could you risk upsetting this president when all he does is look at things that, that attack him and respond back. They are entirely focused on the federal government being able to help them. They need military grade equipment in Puerto Rico right now. How could you risk upsetting right. this president when he's an emotional Well, the president infantile? says that he is heading, heading on down there to, to further help and doing everything that he possibly can. Uh, and we wish all of those people well. They're in a devastating situation. But Cheryl, I want to get your response uh, to Zinke and the response um, from some of these government officials. As we do know that Tom Price on special report last night told Brett Baer he plans to put $51,887 of his own money back toward the use of this, uh, these private, these government planes. Ryan Zeke makes a fair point. There is reason for responsible use of those government planes. He said he was fully approved to do so. Well, of course, federal officials need to get to the sites of their jurisdiction in a speedy manner. They can't be hopping commercial flights just like the rest of us Americans do for all their issues. But the, the thing that's needed here is context and a little bit of clarity. $51,000, $53,000 is not huge when it comes down to taxpayer dollars to getting a federal official to his or her duty station at the, appointment, at the appointed time. What is bigger cause for concern? is frivolous spending. And if you want an example of that, go back to Barack Obama and what Judicial Watch tabulated was $85 million spent on eight years of mm -hmm. Barack Obama family vacations in just that short period of time. And Where's the taxpayer payback for that? Yeah, John Roberts did just point out that fact and the use of these planes compared to where uh, the Obama administration was in their uh, first year of office. So uh, fair enough. We're going to leave it there. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, the State Department is slashing staff in Cuba after so-called sonic attacks against U.S. diplomats. And that's not the only course of action the U.S. is taking. Plus, the president is selling his tax plan as a boon to the U.S. economy. So what will it mean for the housing market? Our very own Deirdre Bolton from the Fox Business Network will break it down. New information on the crash of a U.S. aircraft in Syria that injured two Marines. Officials now say a mechanical issue is believed to have caused the crash. The Marine Corps Osprey, like the one shown here, went down in an undisclosed location in Syria earlier today. Roughly two dozen Marines were on board at the time. The Osprey was destroyed, but the two injured Marines in the crash are expected to be okay. Well, the State Department taking action after the mysterious attacks on American diplomats in Cuba. The U.S. cutting more than half of its embassy staff in Havana and warning Americans not to travel there. Rich Edson is reporting live from the State Department. Rich, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson made this decision this morning. What now do we know? Now, good afternoon, Sandra. And the secretary did make this decision while traveling to China. The final order and the final decision went out this morning to dramatically reduce the amount of U.S. staff at the embassy in Cuba after nearly two dozen American diplomats have been harmed by these odd, mysterious so-called sonic attacks. Uh, so here's the order. Uh, the State Department says all non-essential employees and family are out of Cuba. That means the U.S. is cutting its diplomatic presence there to less than half its current level. The State Department suspending visa operations indefinitely in Cuba and will only conduct emergency services there. The U.S. is also warning Americans against traveling to Cuba. Issuing that travel warning, the department says, quote, because our personnel's safety is at risk and we are unable to identify the source of the attacks, we believe U.S. citizens may also be at risk and warn them not to travel to Cuba. Officials say that 21 American officials have been injured in these attacks 
facts and that they have no information of non-government officials uh, being part of uh, any type of attack like these sonic attacks we've seen against uh, diplomatic staff there, Sandra. Yeah, we'll continue to follow that story. Uh, Rich, Secretary Tillerson attending high-level meetings in Beijing. What's the update there? Uh, he is. He's on his way to Beijing. He will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping. This is his second time in Beijing as Secretary of State. North Korea will be on the agenda as it was the last time he was there in March. Of late, the U.S. has been very complimentary of what China has been doing to try to isolate North Korea. They have agreed to these U.N. Security Council resolutions. They have also started to implement them, according to the Chinese government. They're cutting certain amounts of trade and energy and textiles. Any businesses in China that are conducting commerce with North Korean companies, according to China, have 120 days to stop or close. Uh, but there are critics of China pointing out that that country still accounts for the majority of North Korean trade. Uh, and there are also questions and concerns with China, especially when it comes to those UN Security Council resolutions, as China and Russia watered them down at the UN before they agreed to support them. So the secretary, according to officials, is going to continue to push them to do more, noting that every country can can do more to try to isolate North Korea. Back to you. All right, Rich Edson at the State Department. Thank you, Rich. An emotional return on Capitol Hill yesterday. Congressman Steve Scalise returning to the House floor for the first time since he was shot on that congressional baseball field at a practice. Reaction ahead from one of his colleagues. Plus, the debate over tax cuts and home ownership which has recently sunk to multi-decade lows. What the White House says is the number one reason people buy homes, and it's not the tax deduction. A 12th dead has been reported from a Florida nursing home now that lost power during Hurricane Irma. The Broward County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed the death last night of a 57-year-old patient. Eight patients died three days after the storm knocked out the nursing home's air conditioning. Three others died in the following days. Police are looking at all the deaths as part of a criminal investigation. The White House is pushing back against claims the Republican tax plan could hurt the real estate market. White House National Economic Council Director Gary Cohn saying people don't buy homes because of the mortgage deduction. Listen. The number one reason why, pe why people buy homes is they're excited and optimistic about the economy. They have a job today. They feel confident they're going to have a job tomorrow and their kids are going to get a job and their spouse has a job. They feel like there's upward wage pressure. They feel like there's mobility in their job and they feel good about the economy. That's when people go out and buy homes. So excited to have Deirdre Bolton joining us from the Fox Business Network. Thank and you. Deirdre, I, I've known you for many years. Now. Yes. You dig into these numbers. You know them we so well. Love it. So is what he's saying true or not? So it's true, but it's a bad sales job, right? It's true that if you and I want to go buy a new home, the thing that makes us feel the most secure is our income. Do we think we're going to have a job three years from now? Do we feel it's exactly as he said? But there's just a lot of a lot more to it than that. <laughs> that was mixed in. And I think one thing that people are really freaking out about is this idea of keeping the mortgage interest deduction. So the Trump administration plan is to do that. The catch is that fewer people would be eligible for it. Rightly or wrongly, Americans think they have a right to own the home. There has never been a politician successful in fighting that. I mean, back to the 1960s, right? Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac went public. I mean, the government has encouraged us to own homes. Mm -hmm. And I think in the 30s, when that all started, the idea is you're not going to revolt against a country right. if you own a piece of land. So generally so speaking, what a sentimental issue. What is happening with the housing market? You know, I mean, in recent months, you've re read reports that homeownership in America is, is at a 50 year low. Something significant has changed. I don't know if it's if it's the mentality of millennials they talk about and just the, the, the needs and desires. So there are a lot of moving parts, right? There are for millennials, as we have seen among our own peer group, it's hard to get a job. It's hard to get a job that pays you enough to have your own apartment, or maybe it's easier to stay home and eat your mom's cooking than to go out and try to do it on your own. But I also think it does take confidence, to Gary Cohn's point. It does take confidence to want to buy a house. It takes confidence in your job. And I think a lot of people, even if they are just getting by, they don't feel like because they're going to make this, a big investment. This chart says a lot. 
because while there's been a gradual increase in, in, in single family building permits and housing starts, we are still nowhere near the levels of say 2004, 2005. Which some people may even argue that this is a more prudent looking chart, that this mm. is how the chart should look like. I mean, you and I went through that credit crisis covering oh. that together. And honestly, people who could not afford homes were given mortgages, right? And then that's when the credit crisis really kicked off and we had a very mighty big mess. So, I mean, banks have clamped down. Mm -hmm. They have asked you to show a little bit more statistics to show that you can prove that you can pay that loan back. So some people would argue, okay, maybe the brakes have been put on too much and now we've overcorrected. So perhaps that's uh, that's one of the reasons in there. So a big question is, can the GOP sell this tax plan? You know, Gary Cohn went up there, he was speaking actually during this hour yesterday. And that's when we caught on to this whole idea of him talking about owner ownership and if this plan will encourage people to go out and buy homes. Will it though? Are they are they getting that? In my humble across? opinion, it no. It's not going to encourage people to buy homes. But I think the fact that they're saying you are keeping your mortgage interest rate deduction, I think that's such a big component mm. of what every taxpayer feels that he or she has a right to do. But they need to clean up the language on that. They need to make it clearer, and then they also need to make it clear, as Reagan did in in 1986, that if you make the same as I do, we should both be taxed the same way. It's not fair if I live in a blue state and you live in a red state and somehow I'm going to pay more because that's where you're beginning to see some GOP revolt among House members from so-called blue states, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, California um, are beginning to come forward and say, listen, it has to be fair. So if you're a prospective home buyer right now and you're listening to this, this might sound familiar because Experian did a nationwide survey that resulted talking about how housing costs are actually what's discouraging owner, home ownership among millennials. They said affordability and flexibility are among the top reasons consumers cite for delaying home ownership now and in the future. Um, they also talk about consumers in the survey say that there are too few homes on the market and that homes are too expensive, but they also face a struggle financing a home purchase. That process is just too much for a lot of people. It is too much. And speaking to that chart that you showed earlier as well, I mean, there is this glut, right? After the credit crisis, there was a lot of builders just said, okay, well, we're not going to build homes right now, right? So we're going to slow down. So it did set off this chain reaction that I think we are still seeing even out. And then you layer on top, as you mentioned, the fact that millennials sometimes have jobs that can mm -hmm. pay well and sometimes don't. There needs to be something bigger that shifts. But bottom line, you need confidence in the economy and, and people job. to be working. It's about your job. It's about what's in your yes. pocket, right? Deirdre, thank you so yeah. much for coming on. It's great see to see you. All right. Well, President Trump's earlier thoughts on health care proving all too true. Do you remember this? Now, I have to tell you, it's an unbelievably complex subject. Nobody knew that health care could be so complicated. But the effort to repeal Obamacare lives on. Up next, the latest on the ongoing battle, plus thunderous applause. It was such a moment for Congressman Steve Scalise as he returned to the House for the first time since being shot and seriously wounded during that congressional baseball practice last June. We get more reaction from one of his colleagues, Congressman Gary Palmer, next. Tax reform may be the talk of the town in Washington at the moment, but overhauling health care also a major topic uh, for lawmakers, even after the repeated Republican failures to undo Obamacare. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live for us on Capitol Hill. Mike, so what is the focus of the fight among the GOP on tax reform right now? Sandra, good afternoon. There's a disagreement over allowing people in high tax states like New York, New Jersey, Illinois and California to continue to write off their state and local taxes. The administration says it's time to get rid of that. If you and I make the same amount of money, we live in the, uh, the same value house, we drive the same value car, our kids go to the same schools, should we pay the exact same to help support the federal government? Shouldn't our tax burden be exactly the same? And the answer is yes, but that's not the way the world works right now. If you live in a low tax state, you actually pay higher taxes to the federal government than the exact same person does in California or New York, and that's just not fair. As it is, Republicans are already endangered in a lot of those blue states, and so you're putting them in a tough spot by asking them to vote for increasing their constituents' taxes without that write-off. 
we're going to have to work through this. Um, but, but, I, but I think uh, the, the, we're trying to get a lot of revenue to lower rates. This is the largest revenue raiser. It's about a trillion dollars in revenue when we don't allow you to write off your, your state and local taxes. So uh, if you take this Let away, growth. this thing is going to absolutely right. collapse. So it's, 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 we need it. And leaders are counting on that to provide revenue in order to do tax reform. Sandra? All right, Mike, so what about the next steps on health care reform? Well, there are talks underway here on Capitol Hill, bipartisan talks between Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray. Alexander, a Republican from Tennessee, Murray, a Democrat from Washington State. And what they're working on is trying to see if they can come up with a way to help stabilize the Obamacare marketplace. If they can get enough support, they say they will bring a proposed piece of legislation to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. The Senate's top Democrat is encouraging those senators. Our health care system needs it. Our constituents need it. They don't want premiums to go up and coverage to go down. And it would be a great start for some bipartisanship in this place, which I hope we can continue on issues. There's also the Lindsey Graham Bill Cassidy effort, which fell short this week, but they met with President Trump just yesterday, and they put out a statement saying, quote, over the coming weeks and months, we are committed to holding congressional hearings and working with our nation's governors who believe returning power to states is a vast improvement over Obamacare. Bottom line, those guys are not giving up. Sandra. All right, Mike Emanuel, thank you. Sure. So health care back on the burner. But Republicans aren't giving up on repeal and replace senators. Graham and Cassidy are vowing to hold new hearings and work with the nation's governors. We're going to take a collapsing Obamacare system, take the same amount of money and put it in the hands of people that are closer to you. And I am confident as I can be that Graham, Heller, Cassidy, Johnson will be the alternative to Obamacare. It will be in this Congress under a better process. All right, Alabama Congressman Gary Palmer is a Republican on the Budget and Oversight Committees and a member of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on, sir. All right, so the, the, the Freedom Caucus, very important, important what their current thinking is on this Graham-Cassidy bill. What is it? Well, I don't know uh, particularly about the Freedom Caucus, but I thought uh, that it was workable and was hoping that the Senate uh, could get it through because I felt like if they did, it would be the first phase in uh, a, a longer-term effort to repair our health care system. So where does this all go? Uh, we know it's sort of on the back burner because uh, they're out there trying to sell this, the, the tax, tax cuts, tax reform. Uh, where does health care go? We know the president sort of pushed this into next year. Well, we're going to be really focused on getting the, the tax reform bill passed, but we're also working uh, on the health care. And, and there are a number of Democrats that I've talked with that are willing to work with us on, on the health care side. So. I, I don't think people should give up on, on repairing our health care system. I think that uh, we can get there, and, um, and, and we may get there sooner than people think, but it, I don't think we're going to do one bill and be one and done. I think uh, we need to do it in phases. I said that all along, and, uh, and I think we can address some of the bigger issues with health care, uh, including the uh, uh, covering people with pre-existing conditions and, and making sure that we actually add people uh, to the roles of, of the insured rather than reduce it. It sounds like you're pretty optimistic on health care. Are you as optimistic on something getting done on taxes? I am. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of noise out there about what's in the tax bill and it's, it's interesting since we have the framework and not the, the details. And you've got people out there talking about how it's going to impact different income levels when we haven't even discussed the income levels. But uh, I really think this is the direction we need to go because prior to 2008, there were 100,000 new businesses starting up um, more than were closing. By 2014, they'd gone to 70,000 more businesses closing than starting up. And what's happened to our economy is we've driven uh, investment out of the marketplace, particularly in small business. And what we will have with this tax code is not only will it help individuals and families by putting more money in their pockets, it's also going to help small business uh, in the sense that we give predictability, we bring lower rates, 
and, and more capital investment into the economy, and that, that's going to create a lot of jobs. All right, Congressman Palmer, uh, yesterday was a very emotional day uh, when your colleague and friend, uh, Steve Scalise, made his return uh, to the floor, and he made a very emotional statement about what he has learned uh, from his traumatic ordeal. Let's listen to that. The first thing I can tell you is, yes, it changed me, but not in the ways you might think. Uh, it's, it's only strengthened my faith in God, and it's really crystallized what, what shows up as the goodness in people. I got to see that goodness in people. Congressman Palmer, that was such an emotional moment and, and such a beautiful moment for this country where everyone came together in support of him, um, your friend. And, and I'll remind everyone that that day on that, at that congressional baseball practice on the field, you were just a mere 20 yards away from the shooter. I was, and uh, when he started shooting and we were trying to get to cover, I saw Steve go down. Uh, Steve drug himself from the infield to the outfield, and Brad Winstrup and I were in a position where we were trying to get Steve to stay down, and um, uh, thank God Brad Winstrup was there. Thank God that the Capitol Police were there. If, if they hadn't been, there, there would have been lives lost. There's no question in my mind. but. Uh, once they got the shooter down uh, and we were able to get out to, to try to tend to Steve, uh, Brad Wint Winstrup, uh, a decorated Army Ranger, uh, a combat surgeon, knew what to do for, for a wound like that and was able to fashion a tourniquet out of uh, Steve's belt that really saved his life. And uh, the most emotional moment yesterday, which I, th I think it was my best day in Congress thus far, it was a, a beautiful speech. And, a, a, and just an incredibly emotional time to have Steve come back and to be able to walk in with you, with, even though he's using crutches. But when he talked about what Brad did for him, and Brad came around with tears in his eyes, it was really incredible. Now, it, it, it's been brought to my attention, Congressman, there might be an SEC football game in the future with you and your colleague. Obviously, Steve Scalise, a huge LSU fan, as am I. You know that I graduated from Louisiana State. So what's happening there? Nick Saban sent a note. I, about three weeks ago, I delivered uh, a letter to Steve from Coach Nick Saban inviting Steve and his wife Jennifer to be the guest of the University of Alabama for the Alabama LSU game on November 4th. And our hope is that uh, Steve will be able to walk out on that field pregame. And uh, he said, he asked me, uh, he didn't know how to respond to all the boos from when they saw his LSU shirt and I told him that <laughs> most of the vast majority of fans will be Alabama fans but I can assure you on that day they'll be Steve Scalise fans. Ah beautiful well go Tigers. Congressman thanks for coming on. My pleasure. All right we certainly want to hear about that ball game that'll be that'll be a moment for sure. Well the power is still out for most of Puerto Rican residents and there's no timetable yet for when the electricity could be turned back on. Geraldo is live on the ground with a closer look at the situation there next.